Britain's first ever spy satellite will soon be going into space. The new British spy satellite has been a bigger secret than the nuclear program. Until today, only a few people have been allowed to know its special code name, Zircon. The huge cost of Project Zircon flouts an important agreement with Parliament, so intelligence chiefs have had to devise a cover story. They're hoping that when it's out in space, no one will notice what Zircon really is. These British communication satellites, now being assembled, are critical to the cover story. Launch enough communication satellites, they hope, and an extra one may slip through unnoticed. But they've already blown their own cover story two years ago. And since Zircon's a SIGINT satellite, a spy satellite that listens, any hostile intelligence agency that wants to know will know in a matter of hours what Zircon really is. Oh, yes, I think everybody knows where everybody's satellite is, and you can see lists which are you know, published in defense journals, etc., of who has launched what, where, what its orbit is. Uh, you know, and I think you can probably do this using school children in uh, Milton Keynes or somewhere rather these days. But SIGINT satellites are very, very expensive. British intelligence simply can't afford a price tag like that on its own. So the bill for Zircon has been secretly passed over here to the Ministry of Defence. I've been told by those who've worked here that Zircon will cost about 5% of what the Trident nuclear program is costing. That's between 400 and 500 million pounds. So Zircon's been Whitehall's most closely guarded secret for the past five years. But the need to make defense cuts to accommodate it has meant that rather more civil servants have come to know about Zircon than spy bosses would have liked. And then there's the special reason for secrecy about Zircon. The plan for Project Zircon is a flagrant breach of a promise to Parliament by the Ministry of Defence. They said they'd never again deceive its Public Accounts Committee about expenditure on big projects costing hundreds of millions of pounds, no matter how secret they were. I mean, the whole purpose of the setting up of the Public Accounts Committee in the last century was to make sure that when Parliament votes money, it votes it for specific projects and we ensure that their money that is raised by government is used for those purposes and is given to the right sort of people, the people that uh, can handle that kind of money. And then our job is to check that this is done. Can there be any exceptions to that kind of rule? Not in general, no. Because once you make an exception, <laughs> then of course leakages can occur in all sorts of ways and the basic discipline of public expenditure starts to be eroded and once that happens then you've no control at all. Spy satellites are naturally a sensitive subject, not one about which many people can talk easily. People will say a great deal more off the record than they can say publicly. But a number of senior formal officials agreed to talk to us on the record about the new importance to Britain of spying from space. Now, over the last uh, 10, perhaps 12 years, uh, there has, of course, been a quite fundamental shift uh, in the balance of which sensors, which capabilities you look to. We get increasingly, as you know, a massive amount uh, of intelligence uh, from space. How could it be otherwise? Because the problems we face as an open society is to derive information on intents and our capabilities of a very close society. Uh, we're looking, of course, increasingly at the ability to intercept the electronic signals and increasingly to handle, again, that massive amount of data, confidently handle uh, that information by advanced signal and data processing techniques. The Zircon satellite should dramatically change Britain's international intelligence situation. In the Falcons, we had to rely on American uh, satellite information. But if it is, as I say, if the government wishes it to be what it is said to be, then you will have to have all the appurtenances of, of, a, of, of a, a general and overall strategic system of which SIGINT and satellite information is very important. Are you saying that Britain and NATO effectively depend entirely on the United States for that information? For that, uh, for that uh, strategic intelligence, Mr. Campbell, 
the dependence is total. What difference to the situation for Britain and NATO will be made by the Zircon satellite? I can't talk to you about that, I'm afraid. You're saying that everything about Zircon is, is, is classified? Yes, I'm sorry about that. So why is Britain getting a spy satellite of its own? Well, you tell me it is. I don't know that it's getting a spy satellite, but I'm delighted if it is. I mean, I, uh, I think it's a very important thing that it should have a spy satellite. But, I mean, I think Britain ought to have more satellites of its own. I think, technically, we are really very good at this now. We've been, I think, quite successful industrially in producing effective satellites. Uh, and um, I think it's, it's a growth area in terms of industry as well as in terms, hopefully, uh, of intelligence. British industry tried to enter the space spy race early. At first, the Blue Streak rocket worked well, but eventually, development of a British launcher system was abandoned. After that, new satellites could only go up on other countries' rockets. Plausible cover stories for spy satellites were just as much the fashion then. The United States took the lead by stuffing monkey after monkey into space capsules for so-called biological experiments. Uncle Sam's monkeys in space did distract attention from what was really going into orbit. In order to cover the program, in order to make it invisible, hopefully, to the public and the Soviet Union, they created a cover story and the public version of this program was that it was called Discoverer and that it was a biomedical satellite. So what were the Discoverer satellites really? Really they were satellites known by the, code, the classified codename Corona and they were photographic reconnaissance satellites. It's now easy to float spy satellites into orbit from the space shuttle. Rolling out into space however, Zircon won't be getting out a camera. It's a listening, not a looking satellite with a name as bizarre as its purpose, that Signals Intelligence, or SIGINT. Well, basically, the Signal Intelligence satellites are capable of intercepting a wide variety of communications, uh, radar emanations, telemetry from missile tests, and basically any type of radio broadcast that's actually broadcast. Uh, they're not capable of picking up, for instance, telephone communications along cables but just about anything that is broadcast, uh, even a walkie-talkie, can be intercepted by these signal intelligence satellites. SIGINT satellites are super-sensitive systems. The information received by these satellites is relayed to ground link stations, like Menwith Hill in Yorkshire. So they're rather secretive places too. Uh, we've got one of our gentlemen coming up to see you. Would you like to hang on until he arrives? It'll only be a few minutes. Ministry of Defence police patrols continuously circle the outskirts of the base, keeping watch for suspicious passers-by. Obviously, as probably my officers have informed you, we can't stop you from uh, filming Menwith Hill Station from the road. Menwith Hill Station is the largest centre of the United States National Security Agency outside America itself. The base continuously monitors communications from Europe and the USSR. But in 1975, Menwith Hill was given vital new tasks, the control of the latest generation of American electronic spy satellites. Each of these tracking dishes is linked to a single satellite in space hovering over the Soviet Union. Each of the white golf balls, called radomes, also conceals a tracking dish linked to the very newest spy satellites. We have main engine start for Three, two, one, ignition, and liftoff. Liftoff of Discovery, the first flight, totally dedicated to Department of Defense mission. This is the launch of the space shuttle in January 1985, carrying on board America's latest and biggest ever electronic listening satellite. It's codenamed Magnum, and now hovers over the Indian Ocean, looking, or rather listening, down on Russia. One of these radomes is probably Magnum's link to the ground. How does a listening satellite work? The satellite is out in space, 24,000 miles above the Earth's surface. 
hovering, listening in. But while the ears are out in space, the brain is on the ground. The satellite's targets are selected and controlled by the listeners and their computers. Whatever's picked up is sent back to them by a radio beam from the satellite. A key feature of SIGINT satellites like Zircon or Magnum are their gigantic umbrella-like dishes, which we use to scoop up other countries' radio signals. Each listening satellite can look down on a quarter of the Earth's surface, sifting out valuable signals from the rubbish that's around it. It can focus on half a continent or just a single building. The Soviet Union already knows all about what Western SIGINT satellites can do. British civil servant Geoffrey Prime was convicted of spying five years ago. He worked here, government communications headquarters in Cheltenham, GCHQ, using American spy satellite information. It's GCHQ, not the Ministry of Defense, who is the real customer for the new Zircon satellite. Cheltenham is the British headquarters of SIGINT. Only ten years ago, the very word SIGINT was classified secret. The name GCHQ could only be whispered. Its special intelligence relationship with the U.S. National Security Agency was another secret. But that's all changed. The government decision to order trades unions disbanded has made GCHQ staff the unexpected champions of trades unionism. And GCHQ itself, the most famous electronic intelligence agency in the world. The American end of the SIGINT special relationship is the United States National Security Agency with headquarters at Fort Meade near Washington. This is the center to which both Men With Hill and GCHQ ultimately report. Inside these offices, they know that the GCHQ spy, Jeffrey Prime, had clearances to see the most secret of American satellite intelligence and that he gave it away. Well, I'm quite certain, Mr. Campbell, that there are corners of Washington who certainly do not trust us, and I'm equally certain that that doesn't uh, actually flavor in any significant way the genuine exchange between the United States and the United Kingdom. The Americans really do look to us, uh, the particular capability that is in Cheltenham, they do look to us uh, as uh, very shrewd second centers of independence or for decision of analysis and so on and so forth. Clearly, there's great, great asymmetry between us as far as hardware is concerned. Nevertheless, that asymmetry, the discrepancy between what the two countries' intelligence agencies should gather from the air or from space, has for many years bothered GCHQ. According to Sir Frank Cooper, they first wanted their own intelligence satellite in the early 1970s. But the government of the day turned them down. Finally, however, in the summer of 1983, they got what they wanted. But SIGINT satellites don't come cheaply. It would cost a large slice of the British intelligence budget. Just how large? Very large indeed. Um, I mean, that, that, that would take up, it couldn't possibly be spent in one year out of GCHQ's budget. And uh, even if it was spread over a long period of time, it would be a huge proportion of their budget in terms of the available money. So the money for Zircon, like the money for many other secret projects, is hidden away, laundered inside the defense budget and spread over many years. But concealing the money being spent is one thing. How do you conceal five tons of high technology hardware once you've launched it into space, where everybody can see it? The answer is either one, you don't say, or two, you pretend it's something else. And only one answer would work for Britain. For the British who have only the Skynet satellites in geosynchronous orbit, uh, to launch a satellite and not specify what its function is, is the same as saying that it's an intelligence satellite. So they would have to come up with some cover that would explain it as a communication satellite or some other satellite that, that the British have. And since there's only Skynet, they would have to try to disguise it as Skynet. Skynet, Britain's military communication satellite system, is no secret. Manufacturers British Aerospace will happily send you car stickers and colorful wall posters all about it. We were able to film some Skynet satellites being assembled last year. The second of two new Skynet Mark IV satellites seen under construction was originally due to be launched last month. 
Accompanying them would have been two of these men. They included Army, Navy and Air Force candidates lining up to be the first Britons in space. On the 3rd of May 1985, the RAF celebrated the news that their man, squadron leader Nigel Wood, would be the first British astronaut. A Navy commander would follow, but the Army's man was left on the ground. Then, just four days later, this announcement from British Aerospace said there was to be a third satellite in the Skynet series. So why on earth hadn't the Ministry announced the good news? A third satellite should have meant a third astronaut, and given the Army its place in space. Had the satellite buying section of the Ministry really not told the satellite launching section that there were three Skynet satellites to go up, not two? Which wasn't the only odd thing about British Aerospace's sudden announcement of a third satellite. The announcement said that the new satellite was due to be launched in 1988 and be positioned 53 degrees east as part of the growing constellation of UK satellites. Now, wait a minute. 53 degrees east is right in the Soviet Union. That's where Magnum is parked, an ideal spot for the listening satellite. But the other Skynet satellites are going up over the Atlantic, the only place covering all Britain's NATO allies. There seems to be something rather odd about the way in which this whole announcement has been used, and it's in a very odd position if it is a communication satellite. A former senior civil servant, Clive Ponting's a past master at the art of writing official announcements that try very hard not to say what's really happening. It doesn't actually say that it's part of the Skynet system. I mean, it seems to be going up as uh, later, two years later, um, and simply as another satellite, um, but not necessarily part of the Skynet system. The announcement attracted press interest. Space writer Martin Inns questioned the Ministry about some of the unusual aspects of the new Satellite in the Skynet series. I rang them to ask what they needed a satellite there for, and they told me it was because of the large British military presence in Hong Kong. Not only would it be militarily useful, but it would save them a lot of money on telephone calls between Britain and Hong Kong. Were they surprised that you had rung them up? Yes, they were, because the position of the satellite was not supposed to be known to me. I pointed out that I'd read it in a British Aerospace press release, and at that stage they told me that British Aerospace shouldn't have published that, and if the press release had been properly approved, they wouldn't have had that fact in it. So that the position of the satellite, they said, was supposed to have been a secret? It's supposed to be, but British Aerospace had let it out of the bag just through incompetence or mismanagement. Just two weeks later, another press release was published by the Society of British Aerospace Companies. Their press release had apparently been changed at the last minute to exclude the unwanted reference to the secret position of the new satellite. Telltale extra spaces showed that the original release had been altered. The information concealed below the new typing was that position at 53 degrees east. That was the information that British Aerospace had not been supposed to give out in the first place. The whole Skynet system was supposed to be for use over the Atlantic. There had been no previous mention in any of the literature of the need for this link to the Far East. So, yes, it was a surprise at that stage. Completely new requirement. Oh, yes, which hadn't been mentioned in any of the previous Skynet literature at all. What happened the next time you rang up the Defence Ministry about the third Skynet satellite? On that occasion, I was told that the military mission for which it had been ordered was secret and not a matter that they were willing to discuss with me. And what do you think the secrecy might be about? About what the Skynet satellite itself is for over the Indian Ocean, because um, there still isn't, in fact, a, a, a plausible story as to what it's going to be for. There's other unusual features of the satellite that Britain is putting up in this special position. For example, every satellite that's launched has to have its own ground link station and its own tracking dish, which points at it continuously, sending and receiving the information relayed from space. Well, RAF Okanger in Hampshire is the ground terminal for the new Skynet communication system. Earlier this year, the major electronics company Plessy installed this multi-million pound tracking and control centre for the new satellites. But they've only installed these two tracking dishes, not three, as the company admit would be required for the three satellite communication system. So where's the third tracking dish? We asked Plessy this question. They told us that they were not allowed to answer it and that our inquiries would have to be referred to the Ministry of Defence. And the Ministry wouldn't answer the question either. But there's no shortage of satellite tracking dishes at Government Communications Headquarters in Cheltenham. Challenger, go and throttle up. The Space Shuttle should have launched both Skynet satellites by now. The disasters changed all that. There's no doubt as to when any satellite can go up 
or what launcher it can use. The Zircon satellite needs a cover story, which would have to be about Skynet. And there's a special Satellite in the Skynet series to be launched into a very odd position. All the clues point to one conclusion. This special satellite is going to be Zircon, Britain's first ever spy satellite. And no doubt the Russians will be coming to the same conclusion. Well, they can judge from locating its position, where it is, whether it is in fact possibly communications or not. They can monitor signals going in and out of the satellite and judge from the, the various patterns whether or not it's a SIGINT a sign satellite or a communication satellite. Well, it's the difference between a satellite that would be the size perhaps of a car and, satel and a satellite that on radar would seem to be the size of a medium-sized building. So the difference between the two is readily detectable on radar. And if there is a deficient amount of traffic or no traffic at all, they will conclude that it's not a um, communication satellite, that it's more likely to be a listening satellite listening to them. Soviet defense officials' awareness of the capabilities of Western SIGINT satellites was demonstrated when the KAL, Korean airliner, Flight 007, was shot down. Marshal Garkov appeared in front of maps displaying the exact tracks of U.S. signal intelligence satellites called ferrets. Well, the Soviets have a somewhat easier time of figuring out what these satellites are than we do because they have their own technical collection facilities. Would the general purpose of such a satellite be apparent? Well, you always can tell something about it, um, you know, what its orbit is, uh, whether it's stationary or not. Um, you know, and it, it obviously a fair uh, advice. You learn more about it as, you know, is the orbit being changed or is it not being changed? And what you won't know uh, is, is exactly what is on board and what its uh, technical capability is. Senior defense officials to whom I've spoken say that that technical capability will be superb. Obviously, we can't broadcast the exact technical details of what the satellite's targets are going to be. But Zircon isn't altogether British. Although it's being put together by two British companies, much of its advanced intelligence technology is coming, I've been told, from this corporation. TRW, with offices here near Washington and in California. It's TRW who have manufactured three generations of advanced SIGINT satellites for the U.S. National Security Agency. So why is Britain buying their know-how? There's fears that the U.S. intelligence community takes advantage of its complete monopoly in space intelligence. Well, certainly you do have a situation where, given the fact that the United States has the ability to collect information that other countries are unable to collect, that selective dissemination of that information by the United States or selective interpretation of that information by the United States allows the American government to put a political spin or twist on certain events that uh, allied governments simply are not in a position to question because they don't have an independent source of information. Why would Britain want a spy satellite of its own? Oh, I think for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, first of all, I think uh, there's a degree of what one might call macro and macro politics in it. It would give us a national capability. So that we knew what was going on in an independent way. It also, I think, does give us a standing in our relation, particularly, for example, with the United States. I think the Americans historically have always said, you know, you put your money on the table, you know, and, and you get something out of our, uh, our, our shop. But if you don't put your money on the table, you know, you don't get as much. But what's Britain putting money on the table for? Will the intelligence obtained be worth the huge amount of money needed? Secrecy makes it hard to tell. Well, of course, one of the uh, real advantages of having these super sensitive programs that the government has, can't discuss, so it says, is that, uh, among other people who can't get a look at them, are legislatures. Uh, the money is buried in the budget somewhere, because, but because it is so highly classified, the legislature really is not able to get a look at that budget and raise questions about whether the money is being wisely spent. In Britain, the Parliamentary Public Accounts Committee are supposed to check how money is being spent. In 1981, they were outraged to discover that the Defence Ministry had secretly spent a billion pounds on modernising Polaris nuclear missiles. The Ministry had to promise that they'd never do that again. But they wanted to keep quiet about Zircon. 
so ministry officials planned how to get round the promise. But how can nearly half a billion pounds be lost in the defence budget? I mean, it would be a matter, of, no doubt, of clearing it with the controller and auditor general. And I suppose they would have to get his agreement not to tell the politicians on the Public Accounts Committee. Well, I think one would have to be very careful about, if you've come to an arrangement with the PIC, uh, having, uh, you know, betraying that arrangement in, in, in one way or another. Uh, so, uh, and I don't know how much change, if any, there's been in the past few years. But I mean, certainly my own view would have been, if I had come to an arrangement with the Public Accounts Committee, that one would have stuck to it. And Parliament thinks exactly the same. Only last year, the committee emphatically warned Whitehall that they reaffirmed the importance they attached to keeping Parliament reliably informed about the major projects list. Are the Ministry of Defence allowed to leave anything at all off the list? No, no, we make sure that everything is on that list. And I, uh, through repeated assertions, make sure that, that is so. And you've been quite certain that that message has got through? Mm, indeed I have. But at the moment, the Zircon satellite is not something that's yet been officially notified to you? It's not a, one of the major projects at, the, at this uh, moment, as I, as I can recall it. If our information is right, would that be a breach of the rules that the Ministry of Defence had agreed to abide by? Certainly we would expect any project over £250 million pounds to be brought to our notice. So if our evidence is correct, the Ministry of Defence may have reached its own agreement? Well, well I'd like to go into that uh, rather more fully. Certainly uh, I stand by the whole purpose of the major project statement that anything costing more than £250 million pounds over its life would be brought to our committee. And if this hasn't been done, obviously this would be a most serious matter. What do you think you would do if you find an investigation that our... I wouldn't uh, like to deal with a hypothetical question. This is a matter to which I would uh, give uh, very serious consideration indeed in view of the assurances that we've been given in the past. Were these assurances given firmly? I certainly took them to be firm. And honourably? Certainly. Sir Frank Cooper made his agreement with the Public Accounts Committee in 1982, but left office the same year. The very next year, the agreement was broken, and half a billion pounds is now to be siphoned out of the defence budget, with Parliament completely in the dark. But it's Parliament, not officials, which makes the rules and the laws. And as the Public Accounts Committee said, full accountability to Parliament is imperative.